Hey, hello, I'm Ren Ribeiro, and I want to connect with you about peace and justice. We are interviewing women who labor for peace, as we have forever and always will, until we all feel peace in our homes, our workplaces, our communities, and especially our bodies and minds. This initiative is named Mujeres Co-Labor for Peace. It's a show of intimate conversations with justice workers who are healing their self and communities from the effects of misogyny, capitalism, and climate change. Welcome to the show. My name is Ren Ribeiro, and I wish you complete wellness and lasting peace. Today, we'll get to meet Mary McClintock, a woman who has dedicated her life to social justice in the form of access to housing and food and spaces for lesbian connection. She's a writer and has also kept a vigil for peace for over 20 years. Let's do some mindful breathing and a heart check-in. My heart is feeling really worn out and tired and needing a bit of joy. How is your heart? Let's take a nice deep breath together and get into episode 16. Mary McClintock. <laughs> Mary in retrograde. Gotta love it. We are once again having a intimate conversation about healing the effects of misogyny, capitalism, and climate change because the first conversation was not recorded. <laughs> oh my goodness. Gotta love it. I love it. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, um, <laughs> clearly this is something one could talk about for a long time. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, we, we did a heart check-in <laughs> in the beginning. And um, do you want, do you want to check in again or um, maybe just say a word about how this um, one? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, you know, curious, intrigued and, um, uh yeah yeah and hope changes everything um which is a line from a emma's revolution song and which i you know think about a lot um as hope is a way yeah hope oh yeah fantastic well i want to i want to begin and, and sort of introduce you um as uh, an unsung heroine because you received a, an award uh, with the same name or by the same name in 2019 by the Mass Commission on the Status of Women. And did you say that that was a new name or? Um, no, the, it's, no, the name of the organization has remained the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women. They used to do an annual unsung heroine award and now they've I think they've changed it to something like Commonwealth Heroine Awards mm -hmm. or something. I think they took out the unsung part. Um, mm -hmm. But at that time, that's what it was. And it, yes, it's a it's a, an award where um, state representatives and state senators nominate a woman from their constituency who is doing something that they want to recognize um, and and they make this award and they and there was a whole event at the state house and um with all these amazing women from all over the state who you know we heard very brief introductions about each and had this whole booklet with all this and i you know i remember listening and saying oh i want to talk to her oh, i want to talk to her because there was a lot of really powerful work being done i think it's a real testament to the power of individuals working in community to make things happen Mm. Um, and it, it's a real, it actually in the category of hope changes everything. It really, um, it was very hopeful and okay. There are all these women doing all this great stuff. Um, yeah. 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 I was torn today. It's like, do I wear hope changes everything or do I wear a uh, cultivate lesbian joy t-shirt? But I chose hope today. So I love it. I love it. It's kind of, for me, a mashup of Joanna Macy's act of hope and, and, uh, Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything. It's just like <laughs> Act of Hope Changes Everything. Love it. Yeah. Yes. Hope. Right. Hope changes everything. You've noted so many ways in which you weave networks together. Um, and that is one of those that you you want to continue weaving. Yeah. I mean, I well, and that's how I met how I met you is through another friend. I mean, that whole networking and connections. I mean, that is 
really the a lot of the core of my life is um making connections doing community building being part of communities yeah that's what i do yeah yeah beautiful so um you you have woven networks of um being uh, up for lesbian intergenerational lesbians um for people um who are uh, food in housing insecure to secure housing and um meals there's a fair housing workshop on virtual via zoom may 8th 6 30 to 7 30 you can beam in from anywhere and it's about um housing discrimination and knowing your rights around housing um and it's being uh co sponsored by the massachusetts fair housing center and the Franklin Community Cooperative that operates Greenfield's Market and McCusker's Market um, in Franklin right. County. Um, and that is that will be an opportunity to uh, not be isolated in dealing with whatever housing issues, you know, people are dealing with to learn and to connect with other people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the housing work, the peace vigil, you still do on Saturdays. At, and that's at the Commons in Greenfield. Yeah. So we have the weekly peace vigil in Greenfield um, from 11 a.m. to noon on the Greenfield Common, which is the corner of Main Street and Federal Street, well, Main Street and Bank Row, uh, 5 and 10, Route 5 and 10, uh, next to City Hall in Greenfield. And actually now starting... This Saturday through October, uh, the Green the Greenfield Farmers Market will be right next to that. Nice, um, nice. Um, yeah. So, what what stories that you had shared um, from healing the effects of misogyny from your childhood and from your work um, in learning to love yourself and learning to love women? Would you like to retell? Well, I mean, I I think um, just like you know, all of this that in turn, well, I said what, and one of the things I've said and what I say all the time is um, misogyny is in the air we breathe. We are trained from birth or before birth to um, hate ourselves as women, to be hate other women, to dim diminish other women and ourselves. And that it takes, um, you know, if you just, if you don't do an active sort of pushback to that, you just keep getting, and you know, we're continually getting brainwashed about it. And um, so I had, I I didn't, I, it's not like as a child, I went, I need role models to be how to be a strong, powerful woman, a competent woman, but I found them. Um, they came across my life. So there's a woman named Sally Edwards, who's her mother and my mother's were best friends in college. And Sally was, I sort of grew up with Sally, like an older cousin. And she took me horseback riding for the first time when I was nine years old. She was became an incredible athlete. She is, is still an incredible athlete who did a lot of marathons and triathlons. She competed, completed the Ironman triathlon 16 times. She won a race called the, the Western States 100, which is a 100-mile running race in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And she early on was a hero of mine, early on was, uh, oh, I could be like Sally. And then I had summer camp counselors who, again, were showing me that, you know, you could be a woman and be very skilled and capable. And and I went to this environmental ed school and was like, oh, there are adults who are, their job is to teach kids about like how, um, you know, banana slugs breathe and what is the difference between chaparral as an environment and a redwood forest as an environment? And I too could, maybe I could do that. So at 15, that became my career goal. I was going to be an environmental educator and after leader. And I did, I did that. I learned and I studied and I did a lot of outdoor stuff and I did that work for my first career. Um, and then I also, when in college, I, did a lot of outdoors, uh, the outdoor activities with um, the outing club, the, you know, outdoors club with backpacking and um, canoeing and cross country skiing. And then eventually I got into ocean sea kayaking and did a lot of sea kayaking and a lot of, and most of that was with women who were very capable. And so we were, all of that was teaching me 
you know, all that was, you know, there was the world saying women can't do this, women can't do this, women aren't good, women aren't capable, women can't do that. But then I had all those women in front of me and I was out there doing it too. It's like, oh, we can do that. We can do that. Excellent. Sure we can. That's that's um, why I do this uh, Mujeres Co-Labor for Peace show because I, I meeting people like you and, and sharing these stories of find you know trusting the people that we meet and and trusting the the embodiment of connection and and letting that inform our our journey is is really key you shared a story that i'd love to hear again about um uh ways in which people in chelsea were were lining up for food and um how did they uh shift midstream to come up with a more equitable uh, solution? So um, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were a whole lot of people out of work because a lot of businesses shut down um, or people couldn't go to work. Um, and, the, you know, the whole economy was sort of in a shambles. And um, so there were a lot of people that didn't have food and they were going, you know, they were looking for food and a lot of communities set up food distribution sites in the city of Chelsea near Boston. Um, the city manager was, you know, activated city employees and they, you know, somehow got food. I don't know where they got the food from. They got the food and they were doing food distribution sites so people could come and pick up food. And um, the city manager was like, wow, this is a whole lot of people moving a whole lot of food around and it's um, sort of creating these whole systems. And, what if um, people just had the money? You know, the the problem isn't the problem is they don't have the money to get the food, um, and so somehow got funding from I some funder and also hooked in um, Harvard University researchers, and they what they came up with was instead of trying to hand people food every week, what if we gave people a four hundred dollar Visa card every month? Um, as a way to support them getting what they need in terms of food. And so they recruited, um, the way they they found the thousand people to give the $400 gift cards to was going down the line with a clipboard, would you be interested in this? And they actually signed up 2,000 people and um, a thousand were, they were, I think it was 1,800, there were a thousand who were actually given the gift cards and 800 who were tracked but who were not given any uh funding oh. um because they had limited amount of money but they were able to see what was the situation for those you know they were compare yeah. what did it mean to have 400 extra bucks a month versus not have that and they um and they found and there was you know this it, this really speaks to the whole notion of guaranteed income or universal basic income that um like that everybody should have an income floor that there shouldn't be zero as the income yeah. floor. There should be some basic amount that will cover basic stuff. And they found, and there's you can look look up look up Chelsea Eats and Harvard, and you'll find the research done about it. Um, and it is an example of there have been a number of these kind of experiments across the U.S. Um, that you can see on Mayors for Guaranteed Incomes website that where there've been attempt you know localized attempts to um, provide this basic, you know, kind of basic income. The, um, and what the city manager, you know, the city manager, it was a, it was a stopgap thing for a period of time. It did not continue for a long, you know, real long period of time, but because it's not something that at a city level or state level could be funded. It's, it's at a federal level, you could fund that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that, you know, I mean, what how many billions of dollars just got voted to you know for war we yeah. there's the 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 question whenever somebody says well there isn't the money for that it's like oh there's plenty of money exactly and right i mean war and right i've been a peace activist for decades and uh war is um well actually war you know misogyny capitalism climate change war particularly war perpetrated by the U.S. or supported by the U.S., um, absolutely negatively impacts women all over the world and within this world is part of the part the of reinforcing, violence against women is reinforcing power over 
um, capitalism, follow the money, um, money that the money that the the you you know taxpayer dollars from the U.S. that are given to another country for to support their military is actually giving them money to buy weapons from us exactly from the companies. So that's capitalism and climate change. Um, when I look at pictures of bombed out places all over the world, and a lot of those bombed out places include a whole bunch of concrete buildings buildings that are made with concrete. Concrete is one of the major climate change impactors in terms of greenhouse yeah. gas making. Oh, and so if you're going to, oh, there's your dog. If yeah. you're going to, um, you know, if you're going to rebuild those places, um, that's producing more concrete, that's producing more gas, greenhouse gases. Yes. Um, so yeah, ending war would go a long way to, you know, re really go a long way to all those issues. I, I wonder what gives you hope in terms of those po the political will for change. Where is the hope that changes everything? Um, I think the hope is people taking action. I think the hope is people um, who are like, no, this isn't fair. No, I don't want this to be this way. So I'm going to do something about it. And I'm going to do something about it to some extent individually, but I'm really going to have more impact if I do it collectively with others. So hope is, um, you know, is finding each other, finding who is doing stuff. I mean, one of the things about, um, so I did in 2002, September 2002, three other women and I created what became the weekly uh, Greenfield um, Peace Vigil which um, has happened every Saturday since uh, September 2002 on the Greenfield really? Commons. Continually? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. my I've, goodness. That's oh, every, so enduring. Every, every week. Oh. oh, it's not the it's not the oldest peace vigil around here, but it is. We, but it's, it you know, and in that, you know, every Saturday since through bad weather and pandemic and whatever, I mean, I don't, haven't made it to all that didn't make it as much in during the pandemic and during periods of health issues but um every week there's every saturday and um and part of that you know what is standing on a street corner holding a sign that says peace is cheaper um do for the world um and how does that impact the world well let me tell you we've started zillions of conversations in cars driving by and one of the things is that it's, I mean, that place, the, you know, town common is a place to go say, say your piece about whatever. Yeah. And we're findable. We're findable. If people, people are like, well, I, you know, people come up to us. Well, I was trying to find somebody who's working on this issue. Do you know if somebody is working on this issue? And if you get, you know, anywhere from four to a hundred or however many people standing around on a street corner for an hour, um, some people like doing a silent vigil, but a lot of us do the chatty form of vigil and we have organized all kinds of other events and all kinds of other activities and been, and, you know, like, oh, this, you know, this bill is in the legislature and we should all make sure we do something about that. Or the Connecticut river, uh, you know, is in Northfield, the Northfield pump storage station, project is messing up the Connecticut River, let's take action on that. Whatever, you know, it's it's been a hub of of activism and of organizing. And wow. um, and you know, the ripple effects, you know, we never know. We never know what all the ripple effects are, but there's a story that I list think about all the time that during the Vietnam War, there was a group called um Mothers Against the War or something. There was a, a mother's group that was protesting the Vietnam War and they had a vigil, regular vigil in front of the White House in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And so there was a group of women standing out in the rain in this vigil and Benjamin Spock, the prominent pediatrician, um, was driving by and he had been thinking that he needed to speak out against the Vietnam War. But he... Um, he didn't really know well what he was going to do. And he drove by and he saw these women. Well, if they can stand out in the rain, then I can do something about this. Mm -hmm. And he became a prominent spokesperson against the war. Now, those women had no idea 
that they were having that impact, but they were just putting it out there. And that's a story that actually comes from Rebecca Solnit's book, Hope in the Dark. Um, and um, she talks a lot about hope and the power of hope. And so I think about that when I literally have been standing out with like a half a dozen people under our umbrellas in the pouring down rain at the vigil. Like, we don't know what the impact of this is going to be. But with what Rebecca Solnit talks about hope, she talks about if you're an optimist or pessimist, you already know what's going to happen. If you're an optimist, it's going to be great. If you're a pessimist, it's going to be bad. And so you don't have to take any action because it's already, you know, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But with hope, you don't know what's going to happen. So you can take action to try and influence it. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so beautiful. Yeah. And it's like, it's not the, the, the listening is to what drives us to sit out there with the umbrella or stand out there with others. It's, it's not about the, the impact that we may or may not have with however many people um that's not our business right and that that took a long time for me to understand that i kept wanting this like direct feedback you know if i put information out this way i want information back or if i put you know my time and and energy in this way i want you know income back this way um and when I, that was one of the most liberating things i ever understood um it, the other is all time is my time <laughs> my time to choose uh, what i want to do and how i want to think and feel um but that was so liberating because um, it, it will come back in a different direct direct from a different direction in a different form and and trusting that those streams of income the coming in um, are what nourish and in looking a little bit differently or brought more broadly at um, how our 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 souls are nourished or how our our lives have meaning um, is mm -hmm. is uh, something to certainly have hope in and and, right. and something that we can, uh, regulate, co-regulate, especially. Right. Wow, I'm right. so glad that that uh, I didn't catch that in the first conversation. I'm so glad that I, I uh, know that about you now. Um, this is our our first time or today of of meeting each other in in face to face or virtually. And um, there's so much I don't know about you, but it's it's just like um, mm -hmm. full of gratitude for the work that you have done in all of these realms. Um, what else would you like to uh, share about the healing of, of misogyny, of climate change, and of capitalism? And I, one of the things I would say um, is, um, again, about the, the lesbian organizing I do, um, and particularly intergenerational lesbian organizing, I mean, one of the things that also gives me hope is, um, is you know, having some perspective over time that that there have been, you know, that somehow there have been lesbians finding each other throughout time, and that, and that, um, and that for young, you know, young lesbians that I know today, there's a lot of concern about, well, how do we find, you know, how do I find older lesbians? How do I find those role models? How do I find somebody who, um, you know, it's like, how can I imagine my life going forward? If you're being told that it's bad to be a lesbian, if you're told that you shouldn't be like that and really you should just get interested in boys um, or you're, and, you know, or that you, you know, then if you get told that or if that message is coming to you, um, it really helps to see, well, wait a minute, there's that old, there's that old lady over there and she's a lesbian and she's pretty happy and she's like having a good life. So I could be doing that too. You know, that's, that could be me. I've had young women say to me until they had met me and a group of women that, you know, we were part of, they couldn't, you know, they were like in their early twenties that they could not have imagined their lives as, you know, like that you could live a life as a happy lesbian, or, you know, have a home. Um, and so that has become a real passion of mine of being visible. One of the things I think you noticed in an early looking into stuff about me is one of the things I've done the last couple of years is organize a lesbian visibility, positivity, um, cultivate lesbian joy contingent at the Franklin County Pride Parade um, that is happening this year on June 15th. And, um, and a group of us, you know, from age... 20 something, I'm thinking about who was there, 20 something to 70 something 
walking down the street with signs saying, you know, lucky to be lesbian, lesbian then, now, forever. I have a sign that says still lesbian after all these years on one side and on the other side, it says someone was brave before me. I walk in her path. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we have, you know, and we're just having a good time. And I've had a lot of, and a lot of people cheer and a lot of people come up to us and say, you know, I, you know, I'm so glad to you know, meet you. And can I take your picture? And, and so a friend of mine is actually helping me create a banner now, this big banner that says cultivate lesbian joy. And mm -hmm. we'll be carrying that in the, in the parade this year, but that um, making connections, finding finding others, you know, like part of what gives you hope is I'm not alone in this. I'm yeah. not alone in, you know, misogyny, capitalism, climate change are all huge challenging issues. And individually by myself, if I were just trying to, you know, like push back or like function in that world. And yeah, it's, you can't individually. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be hard, but with community, then there's support, then there's uh, collectively we can do things. There's a great poem by Marge Piercy called The Low Road. Check out that poem that okay. talks about the power of working together. Nice. Um, well, you've got a lot of beautiful resources that uh, that you you call, must call on to, to keep yourself um, nourished. And yes, right. I mean, that's the virtual community that it's, I mean, not just a virtual community, like a virtual meeting like this, but the reading, I've never met Rebecca Solnit, mm -hmm. but her words resonate with me. I've never met Alice Walker, but her, you know, activism is my rent for living on this planet. Kind of that quote, mm -hmm. you know, those, those are things that inform my life and inform who I am and what I do in the world all the time. Nice. Yeah. Holding that, holding one another in that way, virtually in, in our hearts, in our, um, in our moments of, of darkness, when, when, when things come out of balance, um, is particularly hard for me. I, um, was thinking about that. Um, I, I said to a, a previous show guest about heart living from the heart, uh, being a revolutionary act. And, um, and this, this, this guest was, not quite resonant with that and felt lucky to not be resonant with that. And I, and I think a lot of it has to do with unhealed trauma and then me choosing to go into capitalism in banking, to try to make change from within as a single individual without community. I mean, that was just the silliest thing I, I could have done. It was soul crushing. <laughs> um, and then pulling myself out, extricating myself from the 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 policing and enforcing of patriarchy um, and choosing different is that celebration and I'm still learning how to celebrate with and and hold the the sangha of community in my heart on on the regular you know on the day to day so this particular show and interviewing folks like you is is what I'm doing to heal myself, and I'm hoping that others can can relate um, and and heal thyself that way, because <laughs> I Alice Walker to me feels like the grandmother of of healing. Um, it, it, she's just like that embodiment of of the archetype of of mother. <laughs> right, I think. When you're saying, you know, like the resistance to living from the heart, uh, it's scary to be vulnerable. It's scary to have your heart open. It's scary not to have all the walls up. It's scary not to, uh, you know, and to how we be received, how will you be okay, all of that. And so finding, finding other people, you know, finding for me, you know, finding a lot of lesbians who I can be in community with and be myself in that way. And you know, share together in that, um, heart healing. Yeah. yeah. Be safe, trust, you know, in those, those, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tight communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we didn't talk about is, is the class issue and it's, it's, it's inherent in so much of what you're talking about with housing and, and food insecurity, but, um, the confluence of white and class do you have thoughts on that? Um, absolutely. Um, I grew up upper middle class and had, um, you know, upper middle class in suburbia in 
the U.S. in uh, and that is a very privileged position in terms of the country, in terms of the U.S. and in terms of the world. Yeah. And part of my activism comes from uh, trying to um, trying to use the power that I have basically through that privilege to do to take apart that privilege um, to do that. And and absolutely that has been, you know, in my when I think of my work, I mean, I'm somebody who perhaps could have taken a life path that was focused on climbing up the capitalist tower, you know, and, you know, climbing up and, and using my, you know, and not, not just using my privilege, but sort of capitalizing on my privilege. And I have tried to use my, that privilege in terms of class and race to um, undermine capitalism, to undermine patriarchy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I do that very, I, that's very intentional. That's that level of reciprocity is something that if we all cultivate, we can heal all these effects of these pervasive societal ills um, because they hurt everybody. And, um, and when I think about actually the thing we hadn't talked about is climate change. And when we think, when I think about climate change, it is, um, a direct result of the power over a uh, patriarchal uh, capitalist world. The, you know, the, the earth are, you know, Susan Griffin wrote a great book called Women in Nature and made the whole parallel between how women are treated and how nature is treated how the earth is treated. And that separation, separation from like nature is out there and we're here and the you you know sort of that that distance there, there the twain shall meet right no we have yeah, to that right that that we aren't that we aren't nature that we aren't part of the earth yes well mary um i am going to be closing out the season of mujeres co labor for peace in, next month or so um but then i'm going to be coming back next year and i really hope to have you back i hope okay. <laughs> hope in in the change that everything will be uh moving <laughs> moving along um in our in our um collective wellness and and uh, lasting peace <laughs> Great. Great. As, as it shall Great. Uh, wow Mary McClintock, thank you so much for joining again today. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I look forward to meeting you in person, either at the parade or somewhere uh, soon. Okay. okay. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. Bye. I am Ren Ribeiro, and I thank you for joining. This initiative is named Mujeres Co-Labor for Peace. It's a show of intimate conversations with justice workers who are healing their self and communities from the effects of misogyny, capitalism, and climate change. This initiative is supported by Inner Fortune, the full life self-coaching journal that is now digital. Join us for peace and thank you for your heart.